Hello everybody, today we're going to be talking about blockchains and uh, how these um, are going to transform the cannabis industry and why we're using them with our uh, StrainSeq product offering. Uh, blockchains um, present a tremendous amount of opportunity to the field and in order for you to really, I, I think, understand blockchains, you have to suspend um, some of your identity politics. You have to put all that aside uh, and ask yourself, uh, you know, largely identity politics is arguing over what a centralized um, uh, a piece of power should do uh, and with blockchain you have to stop and ask do you need it anymore do you need a centralized a command and control center governing this part of the economy or can it be made obsolete just like monarchs were made obsolete hundreds of years ago um, so suspend all of your your prior thinkings on uh, so socioeconomics if you can for just a brief moment and try to understand uh, the the magnitude and the gravity of what this technology can do for people and uh, it'll be much easier for you to, um, uh, I think, to understand and, and, and grapple with what's going on here. So um, what is Bitcoin? Well, I view things through a biological lens, and I, I view Bitcoin as basically uh, an Internet immune response. Uh, it's an immune response to something that's evolved over the growth of the Internet. The growth of the Internet has, over time, uh, created very large centralized um, power brokers in the Internet uh, that control information. And nothing's more uh, true about that when it comes to the actual banking system. Uh, we have large centralized databases now that are dangerous by design. Okay, they are what we call honeypots for hackers because they collect large amounts of personal identification information, credit card information, zip codes, and uh, social security numbers. Um, all of these things which contribute to over $40 billion in credit card theft every year and uh, of course um, digital identity theft is happening at record paces and creates a tremendous amount of distraction and waste in the economy. Um, much of this is because there are um, economic incentives to centralize this information and uh, Bitcoin is changing that. It's, it's creating an economic incentive to decentralize information uh, and by doing so uh, a currency has emerged out of uh, this interesting um, this interesting technology. Okay, so this honeypot problem uh, is critical to resolve in order for us to move money around the internet. If we cannot um, be certain of the trust of where data stays or is stored, we can never be, be uh, trusting a, a global internet ledger, let's say. All right. So Bitcoin solves this problem by making a global ledger, but, but creating a competition for people to keep it alive and accurate all throughout the globe. The other, the other key thing that it does is it solves something that's known as a digital or a double spend problem. Uh, just like with internet music, uh, it's easy to copy internet music over and over again. Well, how are we going to make digital money if it's easy to copy it? Uh, if it? If it can be copied over and over again, it can be subject to attack like the Federal Reserve, which has been printing boatloads of money for the last uh, five years, uh, and that only leads to hyperinflation and very dangerous economic circumstances and uh, fundamentally um, robs uh, the middle class and makes people poor and enriches uh, folks that are really close to the printing press. Okay, so um, we can't have that. Uh, in order to have a, a good currency, you need to have a regulated or a regulated by code um, issuance, if you will. And that's what Bitcoin is. Built into the program, it's going to emit over 21 million Bitcoins as rewards for people who mine them. All right, we're already at 16 million of these Bitcoins, which is why the price is going up uh, exponentially, because there is we're reaching a scarcity part of the, uh, the printing process. But the printing process won't complete itself until 2140, okay? And at that point, um, there will be um, transaction fees that will keep miners incentivized um, to, to um, keep mining this. So, what are miners? You have to understand why do miners mine. And the reason miners mine uh, is because uh, Bitcoin is a competition for computers to solve uh, problems. That, uh, and those, and the, the proof of those problems uh, weave a lot of cryptographic safety into the ledger, if you will. And we'll, we'll touch on that momentarily. Um, but you also have to step back a little bit more globally and realize what this has become. Ever since 2009, it's been the best performing currency globally. Uh, for ever since its existence, and it's now the largest computer network in the world. It's a thousand times larger than the top 500 supercomputers combined, and that number is probably old. Uh, it keeps seems to be keep going up every year uh, in terms of uh, the number of computers that are turning to this. You'll see the the, the, the network is measured in, in petahashes and exahashes, uh, and more and more of the computers are turning their attention to, to solving this problem because there are very inter interesting economic circumstances to um, be had from this. What you will find in this map are some interesting nodes in Iceland and in China, and these are places where energy is cheap uh, because energy is really uh, the core 
um, ingredient behind Bitcoin mining. And uh, this is what drives most of the cost. So this has created a very interesting symbiotic relationship that people have to keep their eye on, that power plants that um, oftentimes would have to overproduce energy to match demand cycles because you can't actually predict the future. You can't, uh, during surge times, produce perfect synchrony number of electrons to your demand cycle. You have to always overproduce energy according to what you think your demand is going to be. And a lot of times that energy is wasted in heat and, and off-gassed and, and into the environment. Uh, well, Bitcoin miners have found a nice symbiotic home with many power plants, in which case they can return some of that wasted energy and thread it through ASIC cards to mine Bitcoins and effectively produce uh, a form of digital cash. So this is waste getting turned into Internet security. And this symbiotic relationship with our energy sector and the Internet economy is creating the largest um, trusted network of information in the world. All right. So this, this is an evolutionary force we've never seen before, and uh, the rate at which it's growing is, uh, is quite hyperbolic. It is uh, an exponential growth pattern that we're seeing in, uh, in Bitcoin, and uh, we see no signs of this stopping. Um, now, you have to consider, if you're a hacker, how are you going to attack this thing, right? There's 10,000 nodes around the world. They have a tremendous economic interest in making sure all the data is exactly the same on all of these nodes. So for you to hack them, you would have to hack all of them simultaneously. You're not going to be able to go down to Janet Yellen and convince her to move the interest rates one way or the other to help your cause. Um, the, this is not uh, a, a group at the SEC that might have a lot of buddies that used to work at a former bank, and they come sometimes have a revolving door between those roles. Uh, and people start to wonder whether the regulation uh, is really an accelerant to corporate power, or whether it's in fact um, doing its job as, uh, as a regulator. Who regulates the regulators when these things get overly centralized? Well, there's, in the case of Bitcoin, the decentralization means there's no one to bribe, lobby, or coerce. Uh, you have to just earn your merit on the network according to your CPU cycles. So this thing has a heartbeat. Uh, this is how it works. Basically, every 10 minutes, uh, you get millions of global transactions get pooled into a block, and this block is not officially part of the chain until some magic is done on it. Uh, and this magic is, is uh, what I would call a cryptographic um, online Sudoku competition. Okay, So this is uh, a process where all of these new blocks, if they want to be joined to the chain, they have to be cryptographically woven into that chain. And the way that weaving happens is through a hashing process where they computers compete to solve a hash with an unknown set of characters added to it. Um, so this is kind of like a Sudoku puzzle uh, where the numbers of rows and columns can be dynamically extended according to how many computers are competing on the problem. So if, let's say, a block happens to be solved in 15 minutes, the computer code knows, okay, make it a little easier so we try and aim for 10 minutes. And if it goes faster down to down to six minutes, it says, okay, the computer capacity of the network is is now too high. We have to adjust the difficulty, add some rows and columns to the statistical puzzle, and see if they can solve the problem. And the first one who does gets a reward. Now, the reason the Sudoku analogy is used in here, it's not exactly what's going on, but the reason the analogy resonates with a lot of people is that this is an algorithm with a particular characteristic, that it is difficult to solve, but easy to verify. Sudoku puzzles can take a long time to solve, but you just check the rows and columns that they add up and you know that and you can verify them very quickly. That's incredibly important for the game theoretics of the network. The moment the first person finds a solution, all of the other miners on the network confirm that that solution is correct and since it's easy to verify they quickly move on to mining the next block because the next reward uh, the, the, the existing reward they're working on has already been claimed they have to go now compute the next one now the reward is very important the reward right now is 12 and a half bitcoins which happens to be about 60 grand every 10 minutes that are being handed out for this prize uh, this reward means lots of computers want to try and earn that 60 grand and they all compete in what is known to be a mathematical problem that's fairly random uh, it, the computer which first hits this is not uh, you know, intelligently coded in any way. It's just really who can crunch the, the most amount of um, uh, flip as many bits as possible on, on, on highly designed chips to get to the answer the first. And there's just a tremendous amount of luck involved. Nevertheless, if you do this enough, you'll get lucky enough. And on average, miners can predict their earnings and their profitability based on how many of these block rewards that they're going to recover in any given day. So this creates a tremendous amount of incentive for the miners to continually mine. And it also means 
that you know every single block that's been mined, you know that it was mined at this particular timestamp. You probably know that you can estimate the cost of the energy at that time that went into mining that block, the amount of CPU cycles, you know the difficulty that was involved, in other words, how big the Sudoku puzzle was. So every block is kind of etched with this information about, well, this one required so many watts of energy uh, to, to produce, and if you wanted to remake this block and change it, well, you've got all these other computers in the network that don't want to replicate uh, a different block. They've all agreed on what that block is. It's been replicated all over the network. Uh, and so this becomes very difficult to hack. In fact, if you wanted to go back, let's say, 10 or 20 blocks to change uh, a value and redirect a million dollars toward you instead of somebody else, uh, you'd have to recompute all of those 10 blocks faster than the entire network can do the next 10 minutes. Uh, and that's, what, that's what's really built into the security of this thing, is that there isn't enough compute power on Earth to actually race this thing. And if you had that compute power, you'd probably be better off just mining Bitcoin and earning some real money. So um, this kind of aligns people's interests and creates uh, what they call a game theoretic to, pe to keep miners rewarded for bringing internet consistency and consensus on a ledger. It's called a distributed consensus algorithm. So um, this, you have to step back and realize this disrupts all industries. Just because it is a source of money now that's trading for probably about $70 billion, bigger than PayPal and, and, uh, uh, and, um, and Netflix and growing much faster than most of those companies, um, you realize once you can do this, you can move stocks and you don't need a NASDAQ. You don't need a centralized uh, rehypothecation center that might be doing escrows and all of these um, uh, the stock market transactions, um, money suddenly becomes an app. It's not a central bank. Uh, two to three billion people that are unbanked today will be coming into the economy shortly because they just need a $25 cell phone to get banked, um, much cheaper than uh, their previous hurdles. Um, there's $600 billion of remittance, remittances that move across borders. These are people who move out of their country and want to send money home. Well, all that goes through channels right now that are incredibly slow and take 10 to 20% of the money. Uh, you can do this through Bitcoin with very, lo very, very low fees. Um, and uh, this has also led to the largest global Kickstarter in history with the, the ICO market. These are initial coin offerings. People are now issuing their own crypto coins. Um, for their companies so that people can buy those and liquidate those much faster than you can buy or liquidate traditional private investment vehicles like private company stocks. Um, this also becomes a uh, form of scarcity for digital content. If you have cryptographic keys on content, then you can move music around like this and not have to worry about pirating. Um, there are land titles that are going onto the blockchain, stocks, media, IP, voting and smart contracts. Smart contracts are pieces of code that you can put in certain blockchains that are self-execution, uh, self-executable. And as a result, these um, can be, can trigger other things to own cars uh, or and pay for cars. You can imagine cars actually owning Bitcoins and being able to, if they can drive themselves, they can become emancipated taxi cabs that uh, figure out how to pay for their own maintenance and et cetera. Um, these days are coming with, uh, now that money is no longer tied to a person, it can actually be tied to any given thing that can, that can code. So um, this really re you know, redefines our understanding of money and peer-to-peer -peer economies. So um, we mentioned IP in here. So what does this have to do with cannabis? Well, cannabis has a lot of these cannabis patents that are emerging right now. And there's this big, nasty strain name game where no one believes what strain is what. So you go into a dispensary and... You don't see the typical spreads that you might see in a liquor store where you can have a $100 bottle of wine or a $10 bottle of wine. Uh, you don't get those spreads in, in, in cannabis dispensaries because nobody actually believes the labeling systems. Um, and they shouldn't because if you do any DNA sequencing in the space, you'll realize it's all made up. And uh, there's very little consistency between people who um, claim one strain is um, some marquee strain. Well, quickly thereafter, people just start relabeling other strains to the strain that captures a little bit more money and it itself equilibrates in the marketplace. So we don't have um, uh, really good tools for, for proving that a trademark or a given strain is, is what it is. And we know with wider legalization, the tools of, uh, of traditionally doing this will be utilized, and they are. We're seeing cannabis patents emerge. Uh, and many more have, have emerged since this one. There's one for equatorial uh, sativa line that even this patent has gotten even broader. And so um, these days are coming. So, so what do you do? Lots of pa cannabis patents are emerging and you don't have the cash to necessarily play the game of the gamble of $100,000 patents. 
a lot of people look for defensive IP, which is exponentially cheaper and probably more effective. You'll see this in a lot of companies like Twitter and in companies like Telsa uh, or um, Tesla. They are making uh, different positions with uh, with their IP because the cost of IP these days has been it's kind of escalating, yet its longevity is kind of decaying. Uh, patents sometimes take 32 months to issue, and sometimes your patent's extinct before the time uh, that it's up. So uh, defensive IP seems to be another alternative. Um, people who use our, our, our tools here use both, but um, nevertheless, there is something in the, the plant patent statute uh, known as a prior use exemption clause. So if you have proof of business use one year before the patent uh, uh, has issued, uh, this is like a grandfather clause. Uh, so you can basically demonstrate that, hey, I've been using this in a business setting. Your patent that just submarined on me doesn't apply to me because I have proof of prior use. So how do you get that? Do you leafly uh, and a picture on the internet is not going to do it. You really need to get this thing notarized. Um, federal banks are probably not a good place to go and get this notarized. And I wouldn't suggest putting this in necessarily federal databases either because those have been known to be shut down whenever the government has um, uh, a budget crisis. You'll notice the first things they turn off are the things that people love, like the Library of Medicine and the National Parks. Those things are the first thing ripped away from the people as opposed to the, um, you know, the all types of the military industrial um, things that are being burnt that no one has any visibility on. Uh, no, those won't stop, but yeah, we'll take away the goods. So um, those databases we've seen disappear. With this, this brings blockchains into picture, saying why don't we store this information on this global ledger that is immutable and can't be taken down uh, and is a, has a $140 billion network of trust that is, uh, that's increasingly growing. So that's what we do with StrainSeq. Uh, we have a genetic profile. It's recorded with a permanent timestamp blockchain record. It's disaster proof. Its credentials can be given to the customer. Uh, this provides legal proof of prior existence and enables prior use exemption for submarine patents um, that are coming down the way. And just to contrast this with how we used to do things, um, the old way of doing things, well, we were always worried about the asymmetric cost of invalidating a patent. It tends to fall on the entrepreneur in that uh, if you want to re-examine a patent, you're probably going to spend $100,000 or more in an ex parte re-examination. And, and this happens all the time where bunk patents get issued uh, and remain unchallenged because it's cheaper to pay off the troll than it is to pay the lawyers to, to do the invalidation process. All right. So uh, you also have to keep in mind that humankind is doubling all of human data every four months. And so having a centralized agency like the USPTO trying to keep up with all of the existing information that's uh, in terms of prior art. This is a very difficult problem and they are notorious at not being incentivized to do it correctly. If they make mistakes, you're still filing them paperwork um, to, uh, to reverse those mistakes. If they don't pay for the mistakes, you do. So um, the incentives aren't aligned correctly here. And so as a result, we get lots of patents that issue that are bogus that you then have to dance around as a small entity um, or come up with a defensive IP strategy, which is oftentimes more effective and cheaper. Uh, and the way we did this back in 2011, which, um, you know, had we known about Bitcoin, we would have probably done it differently, but at the time we weren't uh, well aware of it, uh, is we just filed a provisional patent to the USPTO, so they have it on record and they can't miss it in a, in a preliminary search report, and then abandon the patent so we don't have to pay for the rest of the expenses of trying to get it uh, to have a questionable patent on genes being um, public. Uh, we said, I right, forget it, let's make it a, 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 an open market here and have freedom to operate. Uh, this can be much cheaper than having to prosecute a patent all the way into existence and then figure out how to actually police that patent into a somewhat gray market. Um, so the old way of doing things would cost us more than $200,000 in sequencing costs and probably more than $20,000 in legal fees and resulted in an abandoned patent on the cannabis genome so that high THC strains should be in the open domain here on forward. Um, now, how do we do this today? Well, we've gotten this down to be only $500 in sequencing costs and 50 bucks in a Bitcoin transaction fee. So this is a 400X improvement getting cannabis proof of existence um, completed. And we can now automate this and do this for everybody uh, so that your strains end up being um, public and defendable and you have proof of prior use um, sitting on uh, with a link to the blockchain. Now, uh, we always encourage people to download their own data so that you replicate our version of this data. Yes, we have the timestamps in the blockchain. We cannot fit the entire DNA sequence profile in the blockchain because it's too much data. We just have a hash digest of that data. And so you have to keep the source of that hash has to get distributed and kept safe. Uh, and so that's on the customer. They take those uh, VCF files and store them in other places. I'd recommend IPFS and other types of encrypted distributed data stores. 
um, but nevertheless, uh, the hash is replicated all over the world, and that is what will uh, what your file will always produce when you run SHA-256 on it, and that's in the blockchain. The other thing we do is we sequence uh, 25 times more sequence than any other sequence provider out there. We sequence 3.2 million bases. This is an important number to ask because if it's a very low number of bases they're sequencing, well, you really don't know whether something's unique. Uh, so more bases, the better. Eventually, this will be whole genome shotgun. You get about 50,000 SNPs out of it. Um, we also tie all 34 cannabinoid and terpene genes in the process, and we run this Rosetta Stone SNP panel so that you can triangulate our data with everything else that's been put public to date. Uh, so MGC, this, which is medicinal genomics, Soiler and Lynch and Phylos have all put hundreds of strains public, but none of them have sequenced them with the same methods, and so none of that data can be cross-compared. The only thing that can cross compare them is this Rosetta Stone that we've built, which sequences hundreds of SNPs across all of the same loci that they've all published before. And so now we can uniquely place something in the tree. No one else can do this. If they're sequencing for you, they don't know whether their stuff is unique in our database and whether it is unique in all the other public databases. So uh, they're just giving you a sense that you're unique based on their own private database, and this is no longer going to remain private. This whole field is going to go blockchain, and it's going to be public, and there will be distributed ledgers of cannabis. Um, IP and, and genetics circulating. Um, we've been doing this for several years, and there's already hundreds and hundreds of strains that have been um, have been fingerprinted into the blockchain. Uh, this also gives you a relationship to all the other tr um, samples out there. It may teach you what things to breed with. Um, it gives you this indelible timestamp, and uh, you get a nice page published at Canopedia to show off your strain with all the cannabinoid and terpene profile information uh, hosted there with the blockchain information. So. Um, if you want to learn more about these types of things, um, please join us at CanMed. Uh, we're always um, intersecting these wild and different fields uh, with the cannabis field. So, um, and uh, with that, uh, please leave any comments or questions below, and we will get to them as we can. Thank you.